Christ. Ephesians chapter 6, so we're going to be looking at uh, verses 5 through 9 this morning. Ephesians 5, or 6, 5 through 9. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Title of the message this morning is Spirit-Filled Service. Spirit-Filled Service. As I was looking at the, uh, at the context of these passages of Scripture that we've been studying, it's uh, no surprise that they all fall into the context of Ephesians 5.18, which says we are to be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And by the way, just as a side note, it's interesting that uh, God in his, his plan had brought, to, brought Tony Evans to speak on the same subject we've been covering here in the last three or four weeks in, the, in this passage in Ephesians. Uh, I'm not sure who needs to hear that message. Maybe I think we all do. That's why, we, that's why God's word is written so that, that we can all get the message. But it all falls into the category of we need to be filled with the Spirit. Now, just to remind you what we, when we talked about that, to be filled with the Spirit means to be completely controlled, to be completely controlled by the Holy Spirit. Not partially controlled, not mostly controlled, completely controlled. Where he has got the, the full reign of our lives. We need that. And it's, there, God makes no mistakes, obviously, but it is no mistake that immediately after telling us that we need to be completely controlled by the Spirit, he takes us and commands us to do things that would take divine help. Things that we would not naturally do. Because, see, that was, that was the whole point of the, the be not drunk with wine where is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You know, the, the, the picture is people do things that are, are out of their character when they're drunk with wine that they would never do when they were sober and thinking right. God says that we need to do things under the control of the Spirit that we would never be able to pull off in our own strength, in our own abilities, in our own thinking, because these things are contrary to normal thought. And so as he commands us to do these things, he says, you're going to need help to do these things. And these are the things he talked about. He talked, first of all, about a spirit-filled wife. He talked, first of all, about a spirit-filled wife. What does she need to do that would take, take divine help to submit to her own husband? That's not natural. Nobody wants to submit to anybody. But God says that, and, and in the order that he has established, as Tony broke down quite well, he has established a, an order in the home for functionality that will function best. But it takes divine help because it's not natural for a woman to want to submit to her husband. 
And unfortunately, maybe it's more difficult for the spirit-filled husband. Because the spirit-filled husband is told, and this will take divine help, to love his wife as Christ loved the church. That is not natural. We're selfish. You know, I, I have fought the self-love philosophy ever since, you know, they first started promoting it. Because the problem is we love each other, we love ourselves too much. It's not that we don't love ourselves enough. We love ourselves too much. That's why he says you must deny yourself. And so the natural thing for a man, selfish pigs that we are, is take care of us. We will take care of us and we want you to take care of us. But that's not the spirit-filled way that God wants husbands to act. He wants us to love our wives as Christ loved the church. We need divine help with that. And then he moved to the children. We need spirit-filled children. We talked about this last week because, again, the sin nature is just as prevalent in children as it is in grown-ups. And we looked at that passage where it says that even a child is known by his ways, whether they be good or evil. It doesn't take long for that sin nature to show up in those poor little innocent babies. <laughs> when they don't get their way, they'll throw a fit. It's not natural for them to obey and honor their parents. But a spirit-filled child will do that. Obey and honor their parents. And then, so he spoke about spirit-filled wives and spirit-filled husbands and spirit-filled children. And finally, he spoke about spirit-filled parents. Spirit-filled parents. What did he say to them? Last week, we looked at that. We're not to frustrate our children, but to raise them, to train them in the things of the Lord. That's hard work. Especially you know, these days as we've been talking about uh, our, our society and how they come against the home so strongly and the philosophies of the world and, and from you know, the Wall Street to Main Street are promoting evil and wrong philosophies, vain traditions, as the scripture calls it. And it's easy to just let it go. Let somebody else teach her children. Well, as the, the quip says, if you don't teach them to follow Christ, the world will teach them to follow the devil. It's not natural, maybe, for us to go to the hard work of raising our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It takes time. It takes effort. But spirit-filled parents will do that. And so it's not... By accident that God puts all these commands on how we deal in, the, in our homes, particularly so far we've talked about, in the context of being spirit-filled. But today he takes us to another place where we need to be spirit-filled. And that is in the workplace. In the workplace. Now, we're going to talk here a, a minute because... We know that he talks about bond servants, slaves. This is the word for slaves. He, we can't uh, change anything about that. Slavery was present and an intricate part of their, their society then. Now, what we need to understand, first of all, is that he's writing to genuine slaves here. He's not talking to... Uh, employees. He's not talking to people that uh, fill out a job application, go get a job. He's talking about people that were sold into slavery or born into slavery. 
Now we know that slavery was and is and always will be horrible. There's no, it was never God's will, never God's plan. It's always been horrible and it always will be. And by the way, just about every people have been slaves at some point in, in their history. Let me read you a, a little historical context of slavery in the days that Paul wrote these words. He says in, it says, in both Greek and Roman cultures, most slaves had no legal rights and were treated as, treated as commercial commodities. Roman citizens came to look on work as beneath their dignity, and the entire empire gradually came to function largely by slave power. Slaves were bought, sold, traded, used, and discarded as heartlessly as if they were animals or tools. Consider, considerate masters, such as Pliny the Elder, was, who was deeply grieved over the death of his, some of his slaves, was the, the rare exception. One Roman writer divided agriculture instruments in three classes. The articulate, who were slaves, the inarticulate, who were animals, and the mute, which were the tools and vehicles. A slave's only distinction above animals or tools was that he could speak. Roman statesman Cato says, our slaves should be, old slaves, excuse me, Cato said, old slaves should be thrown on a dump. When a slave is too ill it, to do his work, do not feed him anything. It's not worth your money. Take six slaves, throw them away. Take six slaves and throw them away because they're nothing but inefficient tools. Augustus crucified a slave who accidentally killed his pet quail. And a man, a man named Polio threw a slave into a pond of deadly eels for breaking a crystal goblet. That was the society that he wrote to these slaves in. Now, as you probably know, Paul has been criticized for not condemning the uh, slavery in his writings. And I don't know why he didn't. I really don't. I, I really don't know why he didn't, because slavery is horrible. Obviously, to treat human beings in this way was unforgivable. But he didn't, and so I, I will not speak to what God has not spoken. I don't know why God didn't do it. There may be in some extenuating circumstances why he didn't speak. I don't know what they are, and I'm not going to speculate. But I do know this important fact. Although God did not condemn slavery in his word, God did more, much more, than condemn slavery. Because what he did, he made the slaves a brother. He made a slave a brother. And in this society, <laughs> there's only one word to describe that, shocking. Shocking. A slave, a brother, chattel to be sold and abused and treated any way that they wanted to, just as slaves were here in our nation. But God says that a slave is a brother. Consider the exchange between Paul and that one little book that you may have never even read unless you were on a goal to read the Bible through in a year, <laughs> Philemon. It's a really exceptional book. And maybe it's God's way of condemning slavery without condemning slavery, if you know what I mean. Because Philemon was a, a slave owner. He was a believer. He had become a believer under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And, but he still owned slaves. But 
But he had a slave named Onesimus. And Onesimus somehow escaped and ran away from Philemon. You can understand why he wanted to. But somehow he escaped and he ran away. But just to kind of fill in the blanks, because I didn't quote the whole passage. I mean, it's one book, but it's still several verses. But what happened was Onesimus, in running away, ran into a guy named Paul. And the Apostle Paul shared Jesus with Onesimus. And Onesimus came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And the book, the book of Philemon was Ones, Onesimus taking a letter from the Apostle Paul back to Philemon concerning Onesimus. And this is what Paul said in Philemon 1.10. He said, which only one chapter, but I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who I have begotten while in my chains. Now, you really need to read the book of Philemon and, and read it in, in light of what we're talking about because the Apostle Paul was, I hate to use manipulative because it sounds devious, but I mean, Paul, man, he was, he was slick. <laughs> he was slick because when he was appealing to Philemon to take back Onesimus, because Philemon had every right to just... Get rid of this runaway slave, or beat him, or he was in the culture. He was in his rights to do whatever he wanted to do with this this piece of skin. But the apostle Paul, he just he's slick. He said he starts out here, my son Onesimus. If I leave, would you kill my son? Would you beat my son? Who have I begotten in my chains? Because he was arrested and imprisoned for, for preaching the gospel. He said, I'm in chains. You want to put my son Onesimus back in chains? You see what Paul was doing? Man, he's slick. But he doesn't stop there. Because he goes on in, in, in verses 15 to 17, he says these, these words. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose. What was that purpose? To come to know Jesus as his Savior. Perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. Especially to me, the Apostle Paul. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. <laughs> you get the full nuances of those words? I mean, the Apostle Paul sends this guy back, this slave back, and he says, he left you as a slave, a piece of dirt under your feet. He's come back to you as my son, your brother. Because we find out that the Apostle Paul had led Philemon to Jesus too. And he says, this is no longer a slave, but a beloved brother. The gospel of Jesus Christ elevated slaves to brotherhood. In fact, he says it quite clearly in some other passages. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 28, he says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Those words would have roasted the the, the pagans in those days, to say a slave was equal with me. He said it again in Colossians chapter 3, verses 10 to 11. 
You've put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. See why God really didn't need to condemn slavery? Because he took the slave out of the slave market and put him as a family member. And so I would say that God played the trump card. He said, slavery is evil. Slavery is evil. But Jesus Christ but at victory over slavery, and he has made us all one in him. So the primary interpretation of this passage is dealing with slaves. Literal slaves. That's the interpretation. You know, when we look at the scripture and we use the principles of, of, of uh, interpretation called hermeneutics, we look at what's, who's he talking to, the culture of the day, who's he talking to? Well, we, we know he's talking to slaves. That's the interpretation. And there's only one interpretation, but there's many applications. And the primary interpretation may be to slaves, but the primary application in our society is to employees. To employees. And so all that's introduction to talk about what the Bible says and this, how we can apply this passage to the workplace. What can we learn about a Christian in the workplace? It kind of flies in the face of what the world believes. So he t deals with two different groups here. First of all, the employees. As a spirit-filled employee, as a spirit-filled employee, what do we learn? Okay, we learn five things. One, a Christian employee should be obedient. A Christian employee should be obedient. That's what the word means. Again, it flies in the face of, you know, we don't want to be told what to do. We don't want to submit to anybody, but he tells us to be filled with the Spirit, submit to one another. But a Christian employee should be obedient. The word obedient means, and you can see right there, to hear under as a subordinate, to listen attentively, to conform to a command or to authority, to obey. See when we need divine help? <laughs> because some bosses are idiots. Some bosses are idiots. I mean, that's just a fact. Because people are idiots sometimes. And sometimes we think that they don't have the sense to tell us what to do. But the scripture says, if you're a Christian employee, you listen to them as subordinate and you do what they say. Now, of course, you know, anybody with sense knows that if they're telling you to do things against God, you know, if you worked in a medical facility, they told you to go help with an abortion, you couldn't do that. You know, I mean, you got to use your sense and, you, you know, God, it's better to obey God than, than man at any time. But generally speaking, unless it's going to kill somebody or, uh, or something, you do what the boss tells you to do. That's what the scripture says here. A Christian employee should be obedient. But secondly, they should be focused. A Christian employee should be focused on purpose. Now, we're going to talk about the purpose in a moment. But the scripture, the words the scripture uses there is in sincerity of your heart. In the sincerity of your heart. Now, that literally means singleness of focus. Singleness of focus. In other words, 
if you're a Christian working in a job, any job, that's what this means. Do the job well. Don't be sloppy. Don't do a lousy job. Do it well. It means you give it your all. With your uninvited attention and effort. You know, I remember once, and I'm going to give a brief preface to my next statement here, but I remember once we had a uh, guy representing the missionary society come into our men's breakfast. We were having a missions committee or uh, conference, and uh, we had a men's breakfast. And this guy came in, and, and he was talking, and he was he was kind of well, I, uh, he was irritating. That was what he was. <laughs> Trying to think of a nice way to say it, but he irritated the men in our group by bragging about how he he was on the job and he and he I think he was a meat cutter I believe and he stopped cutting his meat and he just spent time telling people about Jesus It's a wonderful thing to tell people about Jesus but not when you're working If you can do both of course uh, he didn't have a couple of thumbs no I'm just kidding If you can do both that's one thing but if you stop doing what your boss has told you to do in order to do anything else, that's against the scripture. Even if it's something as good as telling people about Jesus. And I remember our guys thought, man, you're, they're, he's ripping this boss off. Because the boss is to, paying him to cut meat, and he's, telling, he's spending his time holding church. There's a time to hold church, and there's a time to cut meat. Don't waste the time on the job. Take your, take your breaks, but don't take extra breaks. Don't take extra long breaks. You should be focused on the task you've been assigned. That's what this word means. In sincerity of heart, do your job. Christian employee must be genuine. Oops, I didn't underline this one for some reason. A Christian employee should be genuine. That's the word when he's, uh, or the idea he's coming across when he says, not with eye service as men pleasers. Not with eye service as men. In other words, you're not just doing it to show off how good you are. You're trying to be a really good worker, is what you're trying to be. I'm trying really hard, and you can tell I'm kind of going around some things, because there's a correlation here to all these things that he's telling us that are that's significant. But we'll get there. You're not just doing a good job when the boss is standing around. You're not just doing a good job so you can get a raise or a promotion, although there's nothing wrong with raises and promotions. I'm not saying that. You're not just worried about your own gain, but you're worried about doing a good job. For your employee or employer. Because, fourthly, a Christian employee serves Christ on the job. See, that's, the, that's what I was trying to, you know, and it was really hard because all these words that I was using, you know, talking about, you know, being obedient and in sincerity of heart and honor with man, I service as men pleasers, because it's all about Christ. You're working in a, in a secular job or Christian job or whatever kind of job you're working about. It's all about you're working for Jesus Christ. That's the point of this whole passage. Because you're serving Christ on the job. You're not serving you know, your employee, employer on the job. You're serving Christ. Notice how essential and central 
Jesus Christ is to all these expectations that we've outlined here. In verse 5, he says, as to Christ. In verse 6, he says, as bondservants of Christ. In verse 6, he also says, doing the will of God from the heart. And in verse 7, he says, doing service as to the Lord. Five, six, seven are filled with the, with the concept that you, it doesn't matter who you're working for, physically, you're working for Jesus Christ and you are his representative at that job. You're not representing yourself, you're representing Jesus Christ. Because especially, and, and shame on you if they don't know you're a Christian, but assuming they know you're a Christian, you're going to reflect Christ. If you do a sloppy, lazy job, they're going to think Christ, that's, what, oh, that's all Christ is worth. But if you are excellent in your attitudes and in your performance, doing the best you can, They'll, be, they'll see Jesus. Because the whole emphasis here is that we are working for Christ. We are working for Christ, not our employers. Their names may be on the paycheck, <laughs> but we work for Jesus. And it's really, really, really important because of this verse. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. That as, as many bondservants as are under the yoke, count your own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. That is a powerful statement. If you are not the employer God expects you to be, or excuse me, employee that God expects you to be, his name and his doctrine will be blasphemed. Wow. That puts it in a new light, doesn't it? Your boss may be an idiot, your physical boss may be an idiot, but you're working for Jesus. They may tell you things that don't make sense, but you're working for Jesus. You may not be able to stand the man or woman, but you're working for Jesus. So that his name and his doctrine will not be blasphemed. And it's a good thing we're working for Jesus because the fifth thing we learn about Christian employees is a Christian employee is working for an eternal paycheck. We're working for an eternal paycheck. Oh, we, we got to have the physical one because we got to live. And it costs a lot of money to live these days. But David quoted Colossians chapter 3 already, setting our affections on things above. Because we are not working only for survival, but we're working for eternity. And that's what it says in verse 8. He says, knowing that whatsoever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. Whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord. That's our spiritual paycheck. 2 Corinthians 5 7, or excuse me, 5 10. 5 7, where'd that come from? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You see, even when the boss isn't looking or the supervisor's not looking or the camera's not on, 
the Lord is watching and he's seeing what you're done, what you are doing, and he will, you will give an account for that. Which brings me to a, an expression you, you may have heard before. Gear. I love to use this because people outside the church, what in the world? I've never heard of that word. And you know what it means. Matthew 5, 12, first part of the verse. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Gira, great is your reward in heaven. That's what we're working for. That is the eternal paycheck we're looking for. Most all of us, our employees are, are, are employees or have been. Some are retired. I understand that. But he also speaks to the other aspect of a spirit-filled employer. Because some of you are in supervisory, supervisory positions where you have people that work under you. He speaks to you too. Because we need spirit-filled employers also, like Philemon, which we assume he did the right thing. But he says, first of all, a Christian employer must treat his employees the way he wants to be treated. That's the golden rule, right? Do unto others, you'd have them do unto you. A Christian employer, he's told... To do the same thing. To do the same thing. What it's referring to is knowing that he must give an account too. I like what a guy named Charles Hodge said. Masters are to act toward their slaves with the same regard to the will of God, with the same recognition of the authority of Christ, with the same sincerity and good feeling which had been enjoined on the slaves themselves. Treat others like you'd want to be treated. You want respect? Give them respect. You want understanding? Give them understanding. do what they've asked, been asked to do. Because the second thing we find about a Christian employer in this verse, in verse 9 there, where it says, masters do not do the same things to them, giving up threatening. The second thing we know about a Christian employer is that he knows that he's not the ultimate boss. He's not the ultimate boss. And I'm not even talking about the line of your company. I'm talking about your own master. You see, he's talking to these masters. And he says, you have a master. You have your, your own master. Because he must give an account for what he does also. James hit this pretty hard. In James chapter 5 when he said, Indeed the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you have kept back by fraud cry out and the cries of the reapers have reached the ends to the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, if you think you're being treated unfairly, don't worry, God's got you. You're working for that eternal paycheck. You're not working for this guy, you're working for the Lord. God's got you and God's watching what he's doing too. So if you are a supervisor of any kind, you need to be careful because you're not, the, you're not the big boss. Because both the employer and the employee are serving the same Lord. We're all one in Jesus. And both the employer and the employer that are serving the same Lord should be acting like they're serving the same Lord. And living that way. Because Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24 
says, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So whether you're the low man on the totem pole or you're top of the company, which most of us are in between somewhere, <laughs> You are serving the Lord Christ. You're not serving the company or the people. You're working for that eternal paycheck. You're, you're, you're taking the, the temporary paycheck to live, but your treasure's laid up in heaven. So God wants you to know whatever your status is, you serve the Lord Christ. You serve the Lord Christ. The name of my paychecks, First Community Church. And you are my bosses. But there's a higher boss that I'm going to answer for. I serve the Lord Christ. I serve you, but I serve the Lord Christ. And so do you. Whoever you work for. So go serve. Heavenly Father, thank you for challenging us to do right and live right. Pray, dear God, that you would help us to have the right attitudes at our work. Whether we are low or high or wherever we are on the chain of command. Help us, Lord, to remember that it's Jesus that we serve. And we do not want your name or your doctrine blasphemed by our misbehavior or our sloppy work. Help us to be excellent in everything we do. Because we need to do it heartily as unto the Lord.